Let's work a couple of uh, problems with roller coasters and vertical loops. We did a car with a horizontal loop. We did with a ball spinning horizontally. Um, so now let's do a vertical loop here to where we need to deal with gravity. And the first thing that I want to ask is what is the minimum speed that a roller coaster could go to make it through the loop? And we're going to give ourselves a radius of 15. We're going to start out working all this in letters. We'll plug in numbers at the very end. Radius of 15 meters. Now if you think about this, the spot where you have to really worry about are you going to make it through the loop is the very top of the loop, right? That's the, par that's the part where you actually are concerned you might fall off and die. So what is the minimum speed you can go and still be able to make it through the loop? Now if you're going too slow, what happens is as you come up and around, you're going to come up and then just fall down. You're not going to have enough velocity to make it all the way around. If you're going too fast, then what's going to happen is you're going to want to come up and over the track and instead the track is going to have to provide extra normal force to push you down, to keep you down on the track and force you around. The minimum speed you can go would be where gravity is the only thing providing the, norm, or providing the centripetal force. If you're going too fast, you're going to need more normal force to push you down. If you're going too slow, then gravity is actually going to end up being too great and pulling you down. So you want the centripetal force to be set to gravity. So here at the very top of the roller coaster, the only force I would have acting in my free body diagram is the force of gravity. Now obviously the roller coaster would have at the very top a velocity that would be tangential to it. But I'm not worrying about that right now because that is not actually a force. That's just the tangential velocity. So in the y-axis, notice there's nothing happening in the x here, just the tangential velocity. In the y-axis, the only force I have is the force of gravity. That's what's providing the centripetal force whenever I'm trying to solve for at uh, the minimum speed that we could go through a loop. So I can substitute in Fg for, for some of the centripetal forces. It's the only force that's pointing into the circle or pointing out of the circle. Uh, and the force of gravity we know is mg, right? So now I have mg equals v squared over r. Notice here my masses are going to cancel out, giving me something that actually shouldn't be too surprising. The acceleration of gravity is equal to v squared over r, and v squared over r is the centripetal acceleration. So in this case, where we're trying to just barely make it through the circle, too slow, we'd fall off too fast, we'd try to go up above more normal, we'd actually have to have normal force the track pushing us down. This would almost be like uh, you got started, and there even could be a jump right here, kind of Hot Wheel style, if you will, to where it's all perfectly around, um, and you don't need the track to force you down. The acceleration of gravity is equal to the centripetal acceleration. So the minimal velocity that you can have at the very top of the loop and still make it around, not fall off, uh, would be the square root of the radius of the loop times 9.81 which for our given radius comes out to be 12.13 with significant figures because of the 15 two sig figs, uh, 12 meters per second. Now let's expand on that problem a little bit. At what initial height must a hill, because that's how most roller coasters work, right? You start up on a hill, you get pulled up on a hill, and then it releases, and it goes through loops and goes all, all over the place. But at what initial height must this hill be to allow you to make it through the loop? Now a, a lot of people, especially physics students, after learning conservation of energy, energy will say, well, you just need to start at the exact same height as the loop height, and then you can make it back up to that height. But that's not true. Remember, there's a minimum speed because a centripetal force, you still have to have some velocity up here. If you don't have any velocity, you're not going to make it around. You're just going to fall off. So you actually have to have some kinetic energy right up here at the top of the loop. That way you don't just get pulled down by gravity. So to go around the loop, there must be some centripetal force. And we just calculated right here the minimum speed that's going to be needed up here at the top of the loop. So the minimum speed uh, that you're going to have to have, square root of the radius times gravity, we have to have some kinetic energy here. So in the beginning, we start out with all potential energy because we're at rest, maybe at the top of the hill, we're going to drop some height. Um, so all potential energy here in the beginning, uh, PE, or if you will, U sub G, uh, capital U. And over here at the end where we're talking about uh, making it through the loop, and the part of the loop we care about is the top, right? Uh, how high do we have to be to actually make it through the loop? The dangerous part is here at the top. We have kinetic energy and some also some potential energy here because we are still some height above the ground. Uh, for us, 30, uh, 30 meters or two times the radius, right? Because here's one radius and there's two radius. 
So we start out with potential energy at the very top of the hill at some height, hi, uh, some initial height, hi. So that's mgh equals, and all of that energy, whenever you go all the way around to the top of the loop, is going to get translated to the final potential energy. That's m. G. Now my H isn't that unknown H. In fact, the H here is going to be 2 times R, or 2R. So I'll go ahead and label my H 2 times the radius, 2R. So MGH, where the height is 2R at that point in time, and that we do have to have some kinetic energy. You have to have a minimum velocity to make it all the way around because of centripetal force. 1 half MV squared, and we know our V. It's square root of RG. So 1 half MV squared. Now notice here, mass is in every term, so I can cancel my mass. And then whenever you have squaring a square root, right, those cancel out, leaving me one half uh, rg, and I'm going to rewrite that to be g gravity times the radius so that it aligns with the other guy because this was g times 2 times r, so I wrote it 2 times gravity times the radius, and now I can combine like terms and solve around for the initial height you have to have. Now, if it makes you more comfortable, instead of writing 5 halves, because 2 over 2, or uh, excuse me, we, this would have to be 4 over 2 uh, to get like uh, terms. That makes that 4 over 2 plus a half. Um, so then I end up with 5 halves. If it makes you more comfortable, write 2.5. That's perfectly acceptable as well. Notice now I also have a g in each terms, in all the terms, so those cancel. Leaving me the height that you actually have to start at, how high your hill has to be, it has to at least be five and a half times the radius of the loop to actually make it all the way around. If it's any less than five and a half times r, it's going to end up falling off and not making it. And like I said, this is all because you do have to have some kinetic energy at the top, which is what we calculated up here. We have to have a minimum velocity to actually make it around. If you don't have a minimum velocity, square root of g over r, you won't make it around the loop. Next, I want to look at what your apparent weight would be, how much you feel like you weigh on a vertical loop in a roller coaster. Now, if you remember correctly from Newton's second law, your apparent weight is tied to normal force. And so we need to do a free body diagram. We're going to look at your weight at the top and the bottom here, and we're going to start out with the top. Now, at the very top, uh, we're going to set our roller coaster going 14 meters per second at the top here, which is a little bit greater than uh, the minimum speed necessary. So that means we're going to have a little bit of normal force. We're going a little too fast up and around, so the track is going to have to push down with normal force Fn uh, to actually allow this thing to, to push it back down through the loop. So if you look at your free body diagram for at the top, gravity goes down and normal force goes down, and so our apparent weight normal force here. By the way, if you think about which way you feel here, if you're going too fast in a loop, which way you feel gravity is, it feels like gravity is going up because you're getting squished down into your seat and technically down is up here. So the, the direction of apparent gravity has changed. Normal force going down, that's your apparent weight. So let's solve for normal force here in the y-axis because that's where all of my vectors are, right? Only in the y-axis, gravity going down, normal force going down. So let's solve for how much normal force we would experience in this loop going 14 meters per second. No, a radius of 15 meters. First thing we have to work out is what's happening here with the sum of the centripetal forces. Notice we have two forces happening, and both of them are going into the circle. Whenever you have sum of centripetal forces, every, make everything that goes into the circle positive and everything that goes out of the circle negative. Both of these are going into the circle there at the top. So I made both gravity and normal force positive because both of those are contributing. They're helping, if you will, the object going in the circle. So anything that points in, make positive. So sum of the centripetal forces, force of gravity, is in plus normal force. These two things combined is what gives us our centripetal force helping us go around. Now, a word of warning, after I take Fg and make it Mg here, trying to solve for normal force, that's my goal, uh, you might have a tendency to desire to cancel out your mass, but you can't do that. Notice there is no mass in this term. Mass is in two terms, but not the third. We actually do need to know the mass to know what the apparent weight this person is going to fill. So we're going to take a mass of 75 kilograms, that's about average, around 165 pounds approximately, um, so average for a human being-ish. So we're going to take uh, 75 kilograms to be my mass. Now check this out. I know M, I know G, I know M, V, and R, allowing me to solve for normal force. So I'm going to start out subtracting this over and then substituting in numbers. 
So you can see here we come out with about 240 newtons is going to be your apparent weight. Just for reference, 75 kilograms, your actual weight is the force of gravity, mg. So 75 kilograms times g, approximately 9.81. Your actual weight is going to be somewhere around 750. So this is, uh, you're, you're feeling a weight of about a third of what you normally do. Uh, so this is going to be an odd sensation upside down. You are going to feel somewhat weightless, actually much, much lighter, about a third of your normal weight, yet you're going to think gravity is going up instead of down because your normal force pointing down. This is an idea of artificial gravity, if you will, where you think gravity is going up, you're just not as heavy as you're used to. So it's, it's a nice, interesting feeling that you have uh, at, that, at that light spot up at the top of the roller coaster. Now, of course, if you were going a lot faster, if this velocity was much, much higher, then normal force might have to grow to counter that. So in, it, you, would, you could end up having a much higher weight, apparent weight, just upside down, uh, than the force of gravity, depending upon how fast this velocity is. Now, if this thought, of, uh, th if this thought kind of messes you up, just look at this simple idea here. Gravity and normal force are both working together to give you the centripetal force. Meaning that because gravity and normal force are helping each other, neither one has to be as big to get you to go around that circle. Next up, I want to imagine what if this roller coaster came back down on the other side, how much would you feel? Now, down at the very bottom, whenever you reach the bottom, you're going to have kind of the opposite circumstance. Normal force is pointing up because now you're on top of the track here. The track was over your feet, uh, was under your feet, but that's on, on top of you pushing down. Down here, it's back to normal. Normal force is, uh, pardon the pun, normal force is pointing up and gravity is going down. A normal force has to be greater than force of gravity in this circumstance. That way you could go in the circle. Right? Otherwise, you would end up going in a straight line, which I guess technically after you hit the bottom of the loop, normal force will shrink. But let's talk about while we're still in the loop. Maybe you're going to go for the loop again. So normal force and gravity. Normal force pointing up, gravity going down. Now whenever I substitute in over here for some of my centripetal forces, everything that points in trying to cause me to go into the circle, minus whatever is trying to pull me out of the circle, which gravity is going down. That's out. Uh, away from the radius or opposite of the radius of the circle. I cannot use though now 14 meters per second. That was the velocity I set at the very top. But you're going to end up picking up some speed. Notice the conservation of energy idea. I have some potential energy up here that's going to get converted to kinetic. So I need to figure out what my velocity is going to be uh, to actually substitute in there. Now, if you think going around a loop, you, you're starting out at the very top of the loop. You have some potential energy and some kinetic energy. And all this potential energy is going to be converted into kinetic energy. So at the very top, you have some speed and you have some height. Potential and kinetic energy at the top of the loop here. Let's scroll up to where you can, where you can actually see that. Up here, you have some velocity, 14 meters per second. That means you have kinetic energy and you have a height, right? Uh, it's going to be twice the radius, the diameter, 30 meters up here, so some potential energy. And you're going to convert all of that back into kinetic final. Notice here, masses cancel out, one in each term, and also the height initially is twice the radius, the radius of 15 meters, so all the way up to the top of the loop would be 30 meters. There's the velocity initially at the top of the loop, 14 meters per second, which was given, and we're going to solve for VF. So I come out with 28.01, approximately 28, and we'll just use 28 here because it's so close. Uh, meters per second is how fast you're going to end up going at the very bottom here when all that potential energy is converted back to kinetics. So let's plug in 28 for our velocity and then go ahead and solve around for my normal force, what our apparent weight will be at the bottom. Notice now when solving over, we're going to add mass times gravity as opposed to subtracting. In other words, mass, uh, your force of gravity is fighting against the normal force. So the normal force has to be even greater. It has to be great enough to balance out gravity and also cause you to be able to continue in the circle. So when we go through the entire calculation, we come out with an apparent weight of around 4,700 newtons. And whenever you work that out, note uh, the normal weight, 750 times about 10, 750. This is about six times. That means this person pulled six Gs. Uh, at six Gs, this person probably would pass out. Normally, five Gs is about the point that most the average rider could take on a roller coaster. Uh, so this ride might not be as fun as it was designed.